Uh, lots of other things as well. Let's find out a little bit about him. Chuck, the chick, good to have you. I told you I was going to say Chuck, didn't I? You, you got it confused. Yeah, Ch chick is it? Chuck is American, but chick is Scottish. The bit of Scotland I come from. And it actually stands for Charles. It does right? indeed. That's my posh Sunday name. So when I want to be sort of very polite to you, I'm all right to call you Charles. You. Or when you want to be nasty, you can call me Charles. Yeah, you got it. Now listen, chick. It says down on my notes that in 2009. You went along to the Conservative Party conference. Indeed I did. And you spoke on the church should have a privileged place in society. What did you mean by that? No, I didn't. I, you, you, there's something wrong in your notes there. Because really? I, I specifically said we are not asking for a privileged place. Uh, what I said was that the, the church had every right to be a voice in society. One, because we speak for a significant uh, proportion of the population, but also equally importantly, because we often speak for those who are voiceless. You know, for all the weaknesses of the church, there is no other group of people who are spread throughout the United Kingdom like the Christian church, often doing incredible work in some of the most needy areas among some of the most marginalized people, but definitely not asking for a privileged place. Definitely not that. Okay, well, I'll make sure my researcher gets ticked off for that. Good. And thanks for pointing that out. So how did the Conservative Party react? Ah, oh, it, it, was, it was a great evening. It was a, it was a combination of the, uh, the Conservative Christian Fellowship and the churches in Manchester organised the service. And for whatever reason, they asked me to be the speaker. And I was privileged to do so because I, I think we should engage uh, with people across the political spectrum. We should be a Christian voice and we should encourage uh, men and women of goodwill who are working for the good of our community in whatever political party we find them. So whilst I'm the son of a Lanarkshire coal miner, so you can kind of guess my political roots, I was more than happy to speak to the Conservative Party. Well, I was just going to say, your, your latest book is called Moving in the Right Circles. So it is, is being in the Conservative Party the right circles for you to be moving in? Absolutely. Because one, one of the circles, the, the book, what, what I do in the book, because it's all about discipleship, is I envisage discipleship as a series of concentric circles. So right at the heart is walking in the company of Jesus. That's, that's number one. We've we got to know Jesus. We've we got to walk close to him. The circle beyond that is growing in the community of the church. Uh, so I, I want to reaffirm the importance of the body of Christ. There's a whole uh, group of people today who are saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus, but I've given up in church. It's not an option. We're committed to the body of Christ. And the circle beyond that is engaging with the culture of the times. And part of the culture of it, you know, we... There are too many churches who are wishing the 1950s would come back again. You want to hear the bad news? The 1950s ain't coming back again. Do you want to hear the really good news? The 1950s ain't coming back again. We've got to engage with our culture, and that means engaging with politicians, engaging with the arts, engaging right across the spectrum, because we're called to be salt and light. And the big circle, of course, that, that, that gives us the courage to do it all, the big circle around it all, is looking to the coming of the King. Because we are called to live the future in the present. We know that Jesus is going to have the victory, that, e uh, that good is going to triumph over evil, that God is going to triumph over Satan, and that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. So we live that truth in all that we do in the present. So... But let me take you back to your circles. You said the first circle was, was Jesus, and I understand that. You said the second circle was the church. Growing in the community. And, of and you said it was vital that Christians were involved in yeah. the church. But what is the church? And what happens if we have an apostate church and, and, and a church that really isn't the church of the New Testament? Well, I mean, if a church is totally apostate, then it's, by definition it's no longer the church, isn't it? Um, but I think we, we need to be careful about separating ourselves from our fellow believers too quickly. I mean, sometimes we, we argue over the minutia of doctrine. Um, you know, I've been particularly saddened with some of the controversy over Rob Bell's book. Um, do I agree with everything in it? No. Do I disagree with everything in it? No, I think he's a voice to be heard, and I'm saddened when I hear other Christians kind of just dismiss him. Let's, let's debate truth, but let's, more than that, you know, live close to Jesus, and let's, let's walk together in fellowship where we can. If there comes a point at which we feel that part of the church or an individual has gone so far wrong, then let's tackle that then. But you can't 
you can't just detach yourself from the church. Okay, and some of our viewers might not know what you're talking about with Rob Bell. Indeed. He's written a book, of course, which looks at really the doctrine of hell and, yes. and yeah. what we believe in terms yeah. of it. Well, yeah. what do you do if, if you're part of a church which isn't proclaiming the truth as you understand it from Scripture? Well, I think you have to ask yourself the serious question, do I stay here and be salt and light within the church? Or is this uh, so far from what I believe and know to be the truth that, that, that I have to uh, link myself to another part of the body of Christ? I, I'm just counselling people not to do that rashly or over speedily. Um, there's, there, there's got to be a time for dialogue and, and, and if we, you know, the central truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the unique son of God and the scripture says there's no, under, no other name under heaven among men whereby we might be saved. Now if we can agree on that, we can have areas of disagreement on other things and, and, and hopefully work through them. But the problem is the world out there just uh, watches and every time we split, just says, I told you it wasn't worth bothering with. So I think we've really got to be very careful that we don't. And we all need a level of humility because I don't have a monopoly on the truth. Uh, I don't understand the truth perfectly. The truth of the Bible is bigger than my doctrines and my rules. That's not to say that doctrines are not important. They are massively important signposts. But it, it's like Blaise Pascal once said, Le Dieu défini. Which means, if I remember my French correctly, if you think you can explain God, he isn't God any longer. So I think we need that sense of mystery and humility in the presence of God. Well, I'm glad you translated it because I had no idea what you were saying. It's the only bit of French I still remember. Is that right? So, Trig, let, let's go back to, to your early beginnings. You told us you grew up in, in Scotland yeah. uh, and you, your father was a, a coal miner. Yeah. What was life like? Did, oh. Was Christ part of your home? Or? Well, I'll tell you my background. My granny was an alcoholic. And the Salvation Army in our little town was the means of, of lifting my dad from all that. I'm, I'm a perfect example of that kind of elevator effect of the gospel. My granny's an alcoholic. My dad's a coal miner who gets his life turned around and gets gloriously saved. I get to go to university. My daughter goes to Oxford. You know, as part of that, all I am and all I have, I owe to what God has done in my family um, through Jesus and, and, and through the gospel. I mean, my dad used to tell stories that during the Depression, he would would be marching up one side of the street playing his corn in the Sally Army Band and my uncle Alec would be coming down the other side banging the drum in the communist flute band. That's my background yeah. um, and, and you know I, I, I just I grew up in a, in a home where Jesus was real um, We, uh, you, you know I, I had a mum and dad who lived out their life um, we, we lived in a row of miners' houses and everybody knew what they stood for and everybody knew that they were Christian people. And I owe so much to those roots. So you spent some 35 years in the Salvation Army. What, I did. What, what, what instrument did you play? What instrument did I play? Well, actually, one of the... What is sad? Well, it's not sad in some ways. I mean, the Salvation Army has a lot of music, and I did play trumpet very badly. Um, but hopefully, the Salvation Army is much more than people blowing trumpets. And I was actually the denominational leader for the Salvation Army in the northwest of England from 2000 to 2006. Then, for a number of reasons, felt you know I just had to step out of that. So, but I owe so much to those roots, and I still have some great mates ministering, working in the Salvation Army. If, if my notes are right, one of the things that you did in the Salvation Army was was you were released by them to write on particularly what were the authentic uh, the, the, the authentic uh, issues yeah. for, for believers to follow. What, what do you see as those? What are the authentic issues? Well, I never actually got released to write. I used to do that between midnight and four o'clock in the morning, if, if that's released. What do I think are the authentic issues? Well, I'll tell you what I think the authentic issues are. It is responding to the invitation of Jesus, the glorious invitation to follow. Now, the reason I, I wrote the book on, on uh, the Moving in the Right Circles on Discipleship was that I attended an evangelistic rally in Manchester, a youth rally. It was great. I mean, it was heavy, heavy rock music, kind of music you didn't so much hear, it's feeling the pit of your stomach. But these young guys were great. They, they made it very clear, the 400 teenagers there, uh, we love rock music, but we love Jesus even more. Now, you can't argue with that. But when it came to the appeal, they turn up the house lights, the leader of the band steps forward, and I wrote down his appeal. Wrote it down word for word, because this is what he said to the kids. Okay, kids, here's the challenge. 
If you want to get your sins forgiven, become mates with God, and get to go to the big party in heaven, step forward. Now, if I did any hair left, I would have ripped it out, and I was furious. Not with those young guys, because they were totally sincere. Good young guys. Furious with my generation, because we've sold that, and it is a travesty of evangelism. It almost makes following Jesus a selfish thing. I've got my sins forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. Blow everybody else. Jesus never, never proclaimed the gospel like that. Mark's gospel, opening verses, Jesus comes into Galilee proclaiming good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. And repentance is much more than just getting your sins forgiven. Though thank God it includes that. It's about realigning your life and living as a citizen and by the values of the kingdom of God and living for the purposes of the kingdom of God. So discipleship is absolutely key. And I think one of the reasons we've lost young people from the church is we've, we've given them too small a gospel. Uh, we, we haven't given them something worth living their life for. So I think that's absolutely authentic. We respond to that invitation. We accept the demand of, of crucifixion, of dying to self and, and, and putting Jesus on the throne of our life. And then we really take seriously imitation, the imitation of Jesus. I model my life on him. I, I'm, you know, I've grown up, I've lived all my life in the evangelical tradition. I'm, I'm humble and proud to have done that but one of our uh, one of our weaknesses has been that we've said Jesus is is well we've neglected we've rightly said he's our atoning savior which of course he is but we've lost the fact that he is also our example and we are called upon to live cross-shaped Christ resembling lives here on earth so you know like Paul's great bit at the beginning of Thessalonians you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You've got to live like that. I've got to live in such a way that my neighbours see something in me of the life of Christ. If I don't, the rest is, you know, and that's why I, when you put the question at me, what if a church doesn't believe? I, sometimes those arguments can become a substitute for living like Jesus. And I can have all the right answers and all the solid doctrine, but if I'm not living like Jesus, I don't think it means very much. Well, let me take you back to your book, which you've just written, Moving in the Right Circles. You said the first circle was Jesus, yeah. the, then the second circle was the church, and the third circle, you, you said, was the, the wider community. Engaging with the culture of the so, time. So how do we be? an authentic Christian because this is what so many pe people are, are saying today how with a society that we have how do we be real Christians in that uh, in that society well I think we've you know it's it's rooted in that first circle walking in the company of Jesus if I know anything about the age in which we live it is that we've got to know Jesus better than we've ever done before but then I think we need to engage with that culture. Now the challenge is, how do you engage with the culture without being engulfed by it? That's the real challenge. Um, you, you know, uh, J.B. Phillips, wonderful translation of Romans 12, the first couple of verses, which is normally rendered, uh, uh, do not be conformed. Right. Uh, he uses the phrase, do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm passionate about disciple making is if we are not making disciples, the culture surely is. I speak at Spring Harvest and I spoke at Spring Harvest, I've spoken at Spring Harvest holidays as well for the past few years. And last year we had a karaoke evening, which was a lot of fun. It was a great laugh. But I said to people next morning, I always have slightly mixed feelings about karaoke evenings because, you know, on one level it's just good fun. But some of the words and the lyrics that we're singing are quite unchristian, sub-Christian, even anti-Christian. And I said, but I get, guess most of you would give me the, the response, well, we don't really think about the words. And that's the problem. Because we are constantly being moulded by the values of the world. Uh, and, and, and so we, we've got to be rooted in Jesus, engaging, being salt and light, uh, knowing our neighbours, uh, living openly as Christian people, uh, living by an alternative, alternative set of values, not being sucked in by the commercialism and consumerism of the world that we live in. Chuck, Chuck it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank and you so much. And, uh, um, we pray blessings upon you in the work that you're doing. Thank you. Been and, a privilege. And by the way, karaoke, what's the song you sing? Oh, I sing, and I will walk 500 miles. I only do proclaimers numbers. Okay, thanks so much.